Hello everyone and welcome to Stoic Mindfulness and Resilience Training on the Modern Stoicism YouTube channel. My name is Donald Robertson and I'm the course designer and facilitator. And I'm speaking to you today from Nova Scotia in Canada. I've got my dog Mickey here, I think you can just about see her leg or maybe her tail in the background there. So she might be wandering around a little bit. She might bark or say hello. Hope that's okay and uh, the first thing I'd say is if you have a look in the live chat area on the right of your screen if you haven't already if you could just introduce yourselves and say where you're all from I know some of you have been doing that already and can you also confirm that you can all see and hear me okay and while you're doing that there is a 30 second delay I believe on the video so I won't see any questions or comments that you post there immediately but I'll try to answer them later on in the broadcast and I'll just have a quick look just now to confirm that you guys are all receiving audio okay. I can see and hear you. Cool. Hi everyone. Well, let's get on with it then. Let's get down to business. Uh, this session today, I should say, will last X amount of time uh, because it's the first one like this that we've done. So I'm assuming it will last about 30 or 45 minutes, but we're playing it a little bit by ear. If you miss any of it, it's not a big deal because it will immediately be available as a recording on the same YouTube page and you'll be able to watch it at any time in the future. So people that aren't able to make it along today because the timing, some people have emailed me and said it's the middle of the night for them or whatever. So they'll be able to access the recording as well. And your live chat comments, I think, are deleted at the end of this. Uh, I'm reading them as you type them in. I'll probably respond to some of them towards the end of the, the broadcast today. Uh, but there will be a comment section like a normal YouTube video afterwards so you can comment on the recording as well. And I'll tend to add links there as well. So while I'm chatting, if there's something that you guys don't have access to, uh, like Modern Stoicism website or maybe one of the courses or something, um, I'll post the link to that later on in the, the comment section. Uh, do, do, do we have at the present moment, will I check live? Enrolled in Stoic Mindfulness and Resilience Training are 1,707 people. Uh, and that will go up a little bit. I'm going to stop enrolments later on today because this is the first day of the course. So we'll maybe have 1,800 people in total. So there'll be you and 1,799 other people approximately. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that later because one of the cool things about this is that you get to do these stoic exercises and just know that other people are doing them as well. But also the discussion forums, although they're really simple, you're not very sophisticated technologically, but it's incredibly useful um, just to be able to see other people actually discussing how they're getting on with the, the concepts and the exercises. I think so anyway. And uh, I can see people are doing that already. Uh, I'll come back and say a little bit more about that later. So also a quick check in just to see how many people are currently watching live. Does it tell me? Uh, hundred and something? Let's look, let me just double check that. Ah, like 192 people. So hi all 192 people that are currently watching the video. I guess some of you will drop in and out. So let me just say a little bit about the actual week one part of the course, maybe SMRT in general. Let me have a look at your comments first though actually. Has it started yet? Yeah, you guys should be receiving it. I, everyone just confirm again that you're getting audio and video. I know somebody's asking if we've started yet. Is that Scottish accent? Yeah. Cool, all right. I think you're all receiving. So let's talk about the course then. Um, week one is your 
introduction and orientation to the course. You've all hopefully already done the preliminary section. If you hadn't, you should go and do that now. And the other really important thing is that you submit the questionnaires for week one. Try and do that today if possible, um, so that then the, the measurements are going to be more accurate if everybody submits them round about the same time uh, today, the first day of the course. And then we'll do follow-up questionnaires and we want everybody to try and submit those exactly four weeks uh, uh, in at the, the end point of the course on the same days uh, if possible and we're going to in week one look at some basic stoic concepts as well so again smrt isn't uh, an overall introduction to stoicism if you want that stoic week does that so there's a different theme every day over seven days in stoic week that'll be in october this year i'm also running that so that's more of a kind of general overview a kind of little flavor of everything smrt is a bit more intensive it's modeled on cognitive behavioral therapy protocols so it's taking core skills in stoicism and trying to really rigorously apply them so that we can measure tangible improvements that you guys would get from doing that and we've been doing this since 2014 and we've had thousands of people do it so we've collected data from them and we've refined the course based on their feedback so we kind of know that we've got a viable protocol if you like um, so you can go into it confident that yeah a like, bunch of people thousands of people have done this before and they've managed it and they've reported some benefits from it so uh, the only tricky part is making sure that you complete the course that's the hard part with online courses but I think attending these live sessions helps to reduce attrition it helps people to stay motivated and also as I mentioned earlier engaging in the, the discussion forum seems to help do that as well Good evening, LinkedIn Pulse on from Vancouver. Perfect sound. Okay, so we're broadcasting okay. I think the trick with YouTube Live seems to be using like the encoding software and getting that all set right. Um, so this week it's all about mindfulness uh, practices and how those relate to the central concept in Epictetus' handbook, which is distinguishing between things that are up to us and things that aren't. Uh, and we decided that that was simple enough when we were designing smrt we wanted to settle on something that was fairly simple that would make sense as a psychological skills training protocol that looked like it was likely to have some measurable benefits uh, and also that would be distinct enough from cbt practices that people wouldn't just go you're just doing cbt and that would be recognizably stoic and that sounds like Difficult. It sounds like a bit of a tall order. Actually, it was a piece of cake. The very first sentence of Epictetus' handbook gives us this distinction. People call it the Stoic Fork or the Dichotomy of Control. Perfect. By easily recognisable as a Stoic concept, likely to have psychological benefits, eminently trainable. Bang. Right. We're off and running. So it just made perfect sense to design a skills training protocol around this. And then we've got a lot, a lot of other techniques that, that feed into that central concept that you'll be using over the next four weeks. So let me say a little bit about what week one actually consists of. Um, focusing your attention on the here and now from a kind of detached perspective is part of stoic mindfulness. You're going to learn some self-monitoring techniques. There'll be different self-monitoring techniques uh, every week in the course and different audio recordings that you will be listening to. And for week one, it's a thing called the Stoic Attitudes audio recording, which was kind of designed to complement SABs, the Stoic Attitudes and Behaviours scale. So it's basically running through um, a load of Stoic maxims, essentially, in the form of a kind of like a self-hypnosis or affirmation or meditation exercise. Um, so you can treat it like an audiobook and just sit and listen to it and go, oh, that's cool, a lot of interesting stoic ideas. Or you could treat it more like an auto-suggestion thing and try and imagine yourself really immersing your mind in, in those ideas and absorbing them. It depends on your attitude towards stoicism, but we like to say you could do it either way. You know, we're not trying to brainwash you into stoicism, but you could use this as a form of auto-suggestion if you choose to do so. And people love that recording. We know from the feedback that we've gathered in previous courses that the audio recordings are the number one thing that people find particularly helpful and, and Stoic Attitudes recording, uh, the one you're going to be using this week is one of the most popular ones um, ba, 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 focuses on distinguishing between what's up to you and what isn't uh, but a bunch of other Stoic ideas are in there as well okay so these are the things that you're going to be 
covering this week. Number one, it's basically divided into the lesson itself, the daily exercise, the audio recording, the self-monitoring that you're going to be using, and the discussion questions and the webinar. And for each week, each of the four weeks, there'll be different versions of each of those components. But each week we'll have all of those bits, but based around a, a different topic or a different theme. Uh, and the themes build on each other, they're interrelated. So this week, the lesson um, is, I'm sure you guys have gone through it and I'll, I'm gonna come back to it in a moment because one of the things I'm gonna to do today is go through the comments that people have already typed in. And I'm just gen gonna generally pick out questions or areas of confusion and I'll address those right now. Um, so hopefully that will kind of preempt themes that are likely to come up, even for those of you who haven't had a chance to, to read through the week one content yet. So the content's all about what mindfulness means in stoicism basically and how we interpret that and understanding the dichotomy of control, like basic, basic concepts in the handbook of Epictetus. Uh, the daily exercise that people have been doing already and that you should be doing every day throughout week one is actually derived from gestalt psychotherapy, funnily enough. But you guys will recognize it as a mindfulness technique of the sort that you'll find in certain forms of Buddhism. I'm going to talk about it a bit because I notice some people kind of get slightly the wrong end of the stick and uh, it does require a little bit of coaching, it, although it's a fairly simple technique. So Fritz Perls, the founder of Gestalt Therapy, used to call it the ABC of Gestalt. And it basically consists in doing virtually nothing except verbalizing your stream of consciousness. So just saying, here and now I'm aware of, or right now I'm aware of. And the reason for doing that is that we know uh, from a bunch of different exercises that are used in modern psychology, that when you get people to actually verbalize their experience, it changes the, the way that they respond to it. It tends to make them more aware of it. It tends to make them more aware of small details that they hadn't noticed before. So the, it may seem a little bit tedious in a way, just very patiently describing your experiences, describing the details of them can transform and deepen your awareness of them. And that's generally what people report when they do this exercise. And that's almost all there is to it. There's no posture, there's no breathing, there's no visualization, there's no rigid part to it. Like it's essentially just very patiently in a detached manner describing experiences. It's not the most recognizably stoic of the exercises that we're doing, but it does provide a very good initial preliminary training for doing some of the more recognizably stoic techniques that we're going to come to very shortly. So again, as always with any of these types of courses, some of the people's comments that I'm reading are kind of like, well, this is interesting, but what about X, Y, and Z? Well, bear in mind, this is only week one. So of course, you'll see uh, that we're going to touch on other topics. In particular, we're going to say a lot more about virtue and about action in Stoicism. Like, those are in the topics that have yet to come. So the audio recording uh, this week is maybe one of the longer ones. There's a, a bit of relaxation to it. And then there's this kind of scripted approach to Stoic values and attitudes. So you can download that as an MP3, or you can just listen to it on your computer, or you can listen to it on your phone. I would advise listening to it with headphones because then obviously you'll be able to hear things more clearly and distinguish, um, even though I'm saying it in a Scottish accent, like all of the words clearly. Uh, you could burn it on a CD or whatever as well. If you have any problems downloading stuff, let me know. I know always people who use Apple devices tend to get confused about how they would d use MP3s with iTunes. Um, I think you have to download it to your PC and then import it into your iTunes library if you want to use it on an iPhone or an iPad or whatever. Uh, other group members will be able to give you advice on doing that as well. And if you're really stuck, we'll kind of post some guidance online. But that's just an Apple thing. Like, I guess they don't like people using like, uh, EPUB files from other sources or MP3s or whatever. So they don't make it as easy as it, as it could be on other devices. The self-monitoring you're going to do this week, there are some people who say... I have to, self-monitoring is kind of, in a way, one of the least popular parts of skills training. We kind of know that, um, but it's also one of the most consistently beneficial parts. 
So uh, people are reasonably okay with it. Like they're, you know, we, we get them to rank how they feel about different exercises, and people are generally okay with self monitoring. But it doesn't rank as one of the most favourite techniques. But it's very important. It's kind of a building block or foundation for everything else that you do, and it can be seen as contributing to the kind of self awareness that you gain from mindfulness meditation as well. Um, again, the same way that you're pausing and describing your thoughts, pausing to write down what your thoughts and feelings are, will give you what we call cognitive distance now in therapy. And so hopefully um, you'll find it to have that benefit. And you should be aware of that when you're going into doing it. Try and get the benefit from it that it's intended to provide, if that makes sense. So the self-monitoring exercise this week, um, actually, oh, it's even simpler than that. It starts off just asking you to keep a tally or account of how frequently you find yourself doing things that you'd like to stop. Epictetus told his students to do something similar to this, funnily enough. Sometimes people say this is CBT, it's not in Stoicism. Actually, this is from Epictetus. He tells his students to keep a tally of how many times they've succumbed to anger or how many times they've resisted succumbing to anger over the space of a month or so. And that kind of tallying exercise, I think, is incredibly useful. Um, it trains people to be more on the outlook for early warning signs of incipient passions or emotional disturbance or bad habits so that we become better at spotting these things earlier and therefore derailing them or nipping them in the bud before they have a chance to escalate. So in my experience as a therapist, this is often more valuable than many of the other more complicated techniques that we teach people. Um, particularly in dealing with worry and anger management, learning to through patient practice, learn to spot these things as they just begin is incredibly valuable in itself, but also valuable as a foundation for everything else that we do. So self-monitoring technique is pretty simple this week. Um, you can use a clicker. I know someone posted a link to a counting ring, which is awesome. I love things like that. These kind of gadgets are really cool, but you could also just have a bit of paper where you score off a tally. Um, to count how many times you noticed yourself beginning to get angry or whatever, or beginning to worry. The discussion questions uh, this week are, what do you think would be the pros and cons of living a life in which you take excellence of character or stoic virtue to be the only thing that's intrinsically good? That's a bit of a simplification of the stoic doctrine. We need to explain what does virtue mean, why, what does it mean for something to be good in Stoicism. But for the sake of argument, we just want to get you to begin reflecting on these things and discussing them at this stage. So again, you know, have a keep an open mind about it and enter into it with a kind of reflective attitude. You're going to learn more about these things as the discussion progresses. And we also want you to. Uh, there was another question, wasn't there? How do you think Stoicism might be adapted? to suit our modern worldview and way of life. So I'd like you to actually take the time to answer those questions in the last page of week one. And a lot of people have already been doing that. Um, I can't emphasize enough how important it actually is that you type stuff into the discussion and also read what other people have said and respond to it. Personally, I can promise you without a shadow of doubt in my mind that over the years I've learned far more about both CBT and Stoicism by talking to people than I have from reading books about it, like at a practical, concrete level. Like the discussions with other people are really important. Um, it, you you will learn to question your own beliefs, to reflect on them from other perspectives, to understand like how other people perceive Stoic doctrines. So don't. This is a window of opportunity for you um, to engage with discussion uh, from one thousand six hundred ninety nine other people around the world about some of the most important questions in life. And, you know, it's a very valuable thing to do that. It's seldom that we really have an opportunity to talk to people about the meaning of life and, you know, really deep stuff like that. So this is your chance. Like, that's what everyone's talking about in those discussions. And the first question really is intended just to be as broad as possible. You know, what are the pros and cons of stoicism is pretty much what it's asking you. And, you know, like just to, to really engage with that and look at what other people are saying. I read all of those comments and I'll tend to reply to as many of them as I can as well. So I'm going to answer some of those today. Time check. We're 20 minutes in, so I guess like 10, 15, 20 minutes roughly. Um, I'm going to spend covering some of those comments. 
Uh, we're in the webinar right now. We're going to have a webinar every week at the same time. It's always going to be 2 p.m. Eastern time. And again, you can listen to the recording afterwards uh, if you're unable to make it or even if you, you have to dip in and out and miss parts of it. Keep typing your comments in. Like I said, I'll go and have a look at those afterwards and I'll, I'll try to respond to some of them at the end of the session today. However, before I do that, uh, I'm going to go through some of the comments that people have already typed in. Yeah, burn the books. There's not that many books on Stoicism actually, so it wouldn't be much of a fire. Now, we always encourage people to read the books on Stoicism, and that's why we actually included uh, an introduction to the beginning of the handbooks. We wanted to make sure people wouldn't say, well, you know, your, your students aren't engaging with the Stoic text. No, we've given you Epictetus's handbook to get started with, or at least the, the first chunk of it. And we'd encourage you to read that, but for the sake of the study, the main thing is just to focus on the exercises and get those done, Like, and then after the four weeks are up, you can probably invest more time in, in background reading about Stoicism in general. That's what I would advise anyway. Obviously, it's up to you to do whatever you think is uh, best. Uh, let's have a look at what some of the questions are. So the video um, about Epictetus, I wasn't really sure whether to include that or not, but like I said, you know, some people had said they wanted to see us encouraging people to access the ancient text. So, you know, just to get you started in that direction, there's a, a bunch of quotes from the start of the handbook and a video in week one. Um, questions people have asked. Some people have said, well, you know, I don't believe that you can control all of your thoughts is a, a thing that people sometimes say in response to Epictetus. Um, and, you know, like the Stoics aren't saying that. Um, basically, you'll be pleased to know. They, in fact, they carefully distinguish between thoughts that you can control and ones that you can't control. And that distinction between thoughts that are up to us and ones that aren't is central to modern cognitive psychology. So the, the stories were actually way ahead, like thousands of years ahead of their time in that respect. They make a clear distinction there, which is confirmed today. So we talked today about automatic thoughts versus strategic or voluntary thoughts. And personally, I believe that one of the most important things in therapy is helping people to clarify that distinction. Because many of the problems that people are reporting in therapy are due to them underestimating how much control they have over strategic thought processes or overestimating how much control they have over automatic thought processes. So actually that comes back to distinguishing between what's up to us and isn't in terms of our inner experience as well as um, our actions and the consequences and so on. So some people say, well, this is all good and well, but you can't control your thoughts. You have control over some of your thoughts. If you closed your eyes right now and said one, two, three in your mind, you'd be able to do that because it's a strategic thinking process, generally speaking. But there'll be thoughts that pop into your mind automatically as well. So being aware of that distinction is important. The Stoics talk about the distinction between judgments that we make consciously and decisions that we make on the one hand, and on the other hand, impressions or fantasia that are automatic thoughts, that, like dreams or images, like associations that pop into our mind. And Epictetus wants his students not to be swept along by these, but to take a step back from them, especially if they're troubling or um, provoking of strong emotions. Other things people said, some things are partially under my control. Maybe it's not a dichotomy is a common thing that people say. I mean, again, I, I think um, Epictetus isn't denying that, in a sense, you have control over whether you gain weight or lose it or raise your hand or lower your hand. You know, that'd be crazy. Like, obviously, he knows that you can control things in the world indirectly. But how do you control them? Through your actions. Like, through our voluntary actions is the only way that we can control anything. That's where our locus of control is centred. And by that, Epictetus and the other Stoics include not just um, our intentions to take physical or outward action, but also our intentions to, to do things in our, our mind. So by definition, our voluntary actions are voluntary. We can exert indirect control thereby over everything else or many other things in the world, but we only do so uh, insofar as it's mediated through those voluntary actions. And as you get deeper into Stoicism, you realise that there are reasons why Epictetus and other Stoics want to clearly demarcate 
the sphere of control that we have over our voluntary actions. So he's not denying that some things, in a sense, are partially under our control, but he wants to clearly define the area that's directly under our control. Uh, maybe nothing is under my control, is something that, that people have said. Yeah, I mean, the Stoics were determinists, so in a sense they, they would agree that certainly there are causal antecedents, and there are things that go on in our brain and our body that determine even the thoughts that we think of as voluntary. Um, but then nevertheless, they think some of our mental activity we think of as free or voluntary in the ordinary sense of the word because it originates from our character uh, and from our conscious reasoning. And so they, they think it's worthwhile parsing things in that way for practical uh, purposes. But certainly they're not denying that all of our thoughts have causal antecedents. Maybe acceptance and indifference lead to inaction or passivity, some people have said. So this idea that the Stoic could be a doormat um, is, is a, a, a comment that some people brought up in response to Epictetus. And the short answer to that, I mean, I guess this is a rhetor rhetorical way of responding, um, but it's an easy way to respond. If you look at the Stoics historically, they were like the opposite of doormats. Um, Cato uh, gave his life standing in opposition to Julius Caesar during the, the great civil war. I mean, he couldn't have been a stronger symbol of Stoic opposition to overwhelming might. And uh, Marcus Aurelius like, led uh, the largest army, by all accounts, ever massed on a Roman frontier in defence of the Roman provinces against the invading northern tribes. And he did that at a time when he was so physically ill that people believed that he was on the verge of dying. Uh, he'd experienced many personal tragedies and his army were incredibly weakened because they'd all just contracted smallpox and they were broke as well, they didn't have any money. And so, you know, Marcus was under a lot of pressure to kind of cave in and compromise and so on. He rode out never having led an army before and assumed command of the, the legions in the northern frontier. And he was there for well over a decade. So, you know, like we can point to all these examples like of political and military kind of assertiveness on the part of the Stoics. They were not doormats, in, a, in other words. And there are theoretical reasons why Stoic philosophy would direct us towards action in the world. And um, we're going to come to that more in the later sections of the course uh, when we talk about virtue and action. But the Stoics essentially are trying to reconcile emotional acceptance of things that are beyond our control with virtuous action. And they think really that's, the, in a sense, the crux of their moral philosophies. How can we have a resigned like, attitude uh, emotionally towards things while nevertheless engaging in, in virtuous and honourable action? Uh, so historically it didn't lead to passivity. The ABC of Gestalt, or the, the meditation exercise for this week, I'm going to just say a little bit about questions that people have raised already. Uh, I can't concentrate on such and such during the meditation exercise uh, on the here and now. Uh, oh yeah, I wanted to say a bit about this because this is just a misunderstanding that people sometimes have, especially when people have learned other meditation techniques. Um, beginner's mind, right? Get rid of everything that you've learned. Start again completely from scratch. Read the instructions for the exercise. Uh, it's not a concentrative exercise. Traditionally, meditation techniques are divided into two broad groups. So some of them involve concentration, like focusing on your breathing or focusing on a visual image. Other meditation exercises are more contemplative and they allow a free flow of attention. This is a contemplative meditation exercise, not a concentrative one. So the idea is that you're monitoring your stream of consciousness, basically. And it may be that you have thoughts that pop into your mind, like, why am I doing this stupid exercise? And that's fine. And then you would say, I notice right now I'm having the thought, why am I doing this stupid exercise? Anything that happens, even feelings of frustration, things that you'd normally consider to be distractions, cease to be intrusions or distractions because they become part of the process itself. So there should be nothing that can derail the momentum of this exercise because anything that happens just becomes another part of the exercise. 
um, the obstacle is the way, if you like. You know, it's about incorporating everything into the exercise itself. So people have said, I was trying really hard to concentrate and other things popped into my mind or I tried to concentrate and then I, I noticed I was getting distracted or irritated or whatever. They don't try to force your attention onto anything in particular. Just allow it to go wherever it wants to go and allow yourself to describe in a detached manner what you're experiencing. It's that ability to notice thoughts, catch them early and describe them objectively that we're going for, not any attempt to try and control your train of thought. Uh, what if someone interrupts me and I get irritated with them during the meditation? That's part of the exercise. You know, if someone comes and slaps you across the face with a cold haddock or whatever, that's fine. You know, just say, I notice right now that someone is slapping me across the face with a wet fish. Absolutely fine, just part of the exercise. Uh, what if I fall asleep? Fine. When you wake up, just carry on doing the exercise. Doesn't make any difference. Uh, it's better if you don't fall asleep. It's probably a good idea to do it setting up right if you tend to do that. But I wouldn't worry about it. Like when you wake up, just go and notice that I'm awakening from sleep or whatever, and just carry on with the exercise regardless. Have a Herbert Benson, who was one of the pioneers of modern research on meditation and relaxation techniques, said that he found. Um, in his research uh, in, at Harvard University on the physiology of meditation, that most techniques were kind of much of a muchness. They can produce similar physiological effects, but the, the participants divided into two camps depending on their attitude towards the exercise. So some people would get really irritated uh, if they had intrusive thoughts uh, or they didn't understand the technique and they, they'd get frustrated and they'd tense up. And other people had what he called a, a so what attitude, like they're just shrugging their shoulders, like stoic indifference. And they, if they had intrusive thoughts and so on, they just think, yeah, whatever, and carry on with the exercise. They got much more tangible physiological benefits as a result. Benson concluded, therefore, it's this kind of accepting and different attitude towards the exercise itself that's particularly important not to be phased by anything. Uh, and that's really what we're kind of going for here. Pre somebody asked about whether present moment focus can reduce anxiety and worry. That's a, a central principle in modern cognitive therapy for generalized anxiety disorder, which is the, the worry disorder, basically. Um, yeah, like you worry is intrinsically future focused, at least as it's defined in modern psychology. Uh, worry consists of anticipatory anxiety and what if or catastrophic thoughts about the future. You can't really have those if you're focused on the on the present moment. Worry is kind of a sort of evil self hypnosis that we do in a way because when people worry about stuff, what if this happens? What if that happens? They tend to become so absorbed in those ideas that they respond emotionally as if they're actually happening right now. And they become fused with their catastrophic imagery. And uh, by focusing in the present moment, we regain a certain amount of detachment from that. We, we say, I notice right now that I'm worrying about events in the future. I notice right now that I'm imagining being hit by a bus tomorrow or whatever. And that takes us out of the story. It takes us out of the self-hypnosis. Um, so focusing in the present moment is well known to have this kind of a moderating effect on anticipatory anxiety uh, in a pretty healthy way. The conclusion, the last section where you, you guys were discussing um, the, the questions for this week and the, the concept in general. I'll just say a little bit about that and then have a look at the live chat and I'll see if I can answer some questions that you've been typing in, although it looks pretty busy at the moment. Uh, Conclusions. Some people argue that external things are good. Yeah, like, you know, that's more of an Aristotelian or like maybe a, a, a Platonist like position. Um, Aristotle supposedly argued or his followers certainly argued that the good life consists of a combination or balance of internal and external goods. Um, the Stoics adopted a hard line, though, I famously when they denied that and said, no, the only thing that really matters in terms of quality of life is virtue. So, you know, you may be more of an Aristotelian or more of a Stoic, like, you know, think of this as an opportunity to explore that and think it through. Um, I should say we're presenting a very simplified version of Stoicism here and actually it maybe comes across more like cynicism or other um, schools of philosophy. What the, the Stoics... Um, the Stoic School was founded on a kind of more moderate or compromised position, in a sense, somewhere between cynicism and Platonism. But the, the Stoic said, well, on the one hand, it's true that virtue is the only true good in the strict sense of the word, but 
external things also have a kind of secondary value, which they call axia. So they're not completely indifferent. They have value in terms of plan or, or action. Um, it gets a little bit technical explaining that because that value apparently is lost once those future events have happened and then they do become completely indifferent. But in terms of planning action, the Stoics believed some future outcomes have more value than others. It's natural to prefer some over others. Um, but the value that they have is completely incommensurate with the value of virtue. Um, it, it's never worth uh, sacrificing virtue for the sake of health, wealth or reputation is the hard line that they would adopt. So uh, they're not really saying that external things are absolutely indifferent in that sense. Uh, they do have selective value, but just a type of value that's incomparable to the, the value of virtue. There's no exchange between them. Uh, can Stoics scrap the ancient physics? Somebody asked. This is a controversial point. I, I get a, a lot of angry emails from people about this because they don't think I'm into ancient physics enough. I'm really interested by Stoic physics. There are bits of it that are incredibly useful. Um, my position is that I believe the ancient Stoics were not doctrinaire or dogmatic in the modern sense of the word. They encouraged their students to think for themselves. They kept changing their mind about some of the core principles of the physics. We can see that. And I think uh, they would be perfectly happy with the idea that modern Stoics didn't believe in Zeus or Providence and yet embraced the, the principles of Stoic ethics. So I think they would think that's uh, understandable and that people today could still be Stoics as long as they agreed with the central principles of Stoicism, which we're told by Cicero and other ancient sources were the ethical principles. So I can we scrap the ancient physics? Yeah, I'll probably get shot for saying this, but like we, yeah, I think we, we can in many regards. Although if people want to worship Zeus and or if they just believe in providence or whatever, like that's entirely up to them, and uh, you know that's absolutely fine. We have a lot of people who are Christians, Muslims, or people who who pantheists believe in providence in our community, and, and you know I I hope that we can all get along uh, together. Um, I don't think uh, I don't think there's any real reason for for conflict there. What about tortured artists? Someone has asked. You know, like what if you become too healthy, too rational? You're not tortured anymore like Van Gogh. You're not chopping off your ear. Like, where's all the art going to come from? That's a tricky question, but I, I personally, I'm not really sure. Is it worth being depressed and tortured in order to produce good art? Maybe, maybe it isn't. I don't feel it is. Um, the, it's probably not the only way to produce art. The Stoics themselves had some great artists. Seneca's plays um, are highly regarded by some people. Supposedly, even Shakespeare was a fan of them. And uh, so there were artists even among the Stoics. Uh, do you actually have to suffer in order to produce art? I think that's a much bigger question, but the, my personal feeling is no. You know, you guys might disagree, but it's a good question to discuss. Might you become so apathetic and unempathic towards others by being a Stoic that it would be a bad thing? Yeah, like, I, I think the answer to that is you could be, but it would be a misconception of Stoicism because... Um, it is, I have to say, an aspect of Stoicism that's neglected a lot in modern discussions. But the if you pick up Marcus Aurelius, it baffles me how anyone can read Marcus Aurelius in particular without noticing that he mentions natural affection, uh, social virtues like justice, kindness, fairness on virtually every page or every other page at least of the, of the meditations. That's partly because he's an emperor and he's particularly concerned with that aspect of Stoicism. But uh, this idea that Stoic ethics is based on natural affection seems to have been pretty integral to Stoicism. And the practice of deliberately empathising with other people, I think, goes all the way back to Socrates. And it's certainly an actual practical technique that Marcus Aurelius describes as a method of anger management, as well as something that's obviously closely tied in with Stoic ethics in general. Um, so I, I think if we, we look closely at Stoicism, it's not teaching us to be apathetic about other people. On the contrary, it's a cosmopolitan, philanthropic uh, philosophy of life that encourages us to see other people as our brothers and sisters and to care about them. Um, albeit, as Epictetus says, you know, you should love your children and your family, but love them as a philosopher, you know, accepting their mortality and with a, a 
that with a kind of philosophical detachment in a way, not like imposing uh, unrealistic demands on other people anyway, but accepting that they exist outside our sphere of control. So that, this is a more subtle or more complex part of Stoicism, but the Stoics address this themselves. There are also many references in the, the ancient Stoic literature to them disputing the idea that Stoicism leads to or advocates being someone who's like a, a man of stone or iron or has a heart of stone or iron. Uh, and that, that probably comes from a very early source because it's mentioned by a lot of the, the later sources. So it looks like early on people were accusing them of that. It sounds more like the cynics and the Stoics were saying, no, nope, that's absolutely not what we're teaching. You know, we're teaching a philosophy based on philostorgia or natural affection caring about, about other people's well-being and the common welfare of mankind. Look at Marcus Aurelius, he talks about it over and over again. Okay, so a lightning tour of week one. Please make sure you, you read the week one section today, listen to the audio recording, complete the questionnaire. Um, if you have any questions, email me or, you know, read all the discussions, comment on them, like engage with the other people doing the, the course. And I'm going to have a quick look at your comments here and see if I can answer some of those. I'm just kind of scooch this over a bit and see what you've been saying. And then we'll draw to a conclusion for today. And I guess that'll be about 45 minutes. What have you said? Uh, just like broadcasting from the moon. Yeah. Someone in Canada. Hi, Canadians. Why, how are you? Vancouver. Not many people from Nova Scotia, though, I notice. I, uh, San Francisco, hello, 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 has it started yet? Audio and video are good. I'm going back in time a little bit. Survey says I should check myself in. Right. Uh, you guys want to know where the survey is? It's right at the beginning of week one. Uh, I'll post a link to it afterwards. We, we've had quite a few, several hundred people have responded already, but you know we don't expect everyone to do it. Not everyone can be bothered, but as many people as possible doing it would be great because it gives us more data. And then all we do with that is process it anonymously and tell you guys what we found. And you know the people that, that get around to reading those reports find them incredibly valuable. There's amazing information in there about the demographics of stoicism, the specific areas that people find most beneficial. It's incredible. It's a massively underused resource. There's hugely important information in the reports that, that Tim has done. The dog's appropriately indifferent. I think she's having a snooze. Uh, how long should we do the mindfulness exercise for? Probably five minutes. I, I mean, you could do it. I've done it all day before, and then it, it gets a little bit strange uh, after about an hour. But um, normally, when I'm teaching it to people, I'd get them to do it for approximately five minutes. Uh, found it helpful, transformed the way I uh, viewed my stream of consciousness. Cool, until you awaken the third eye. That's in the advanced course. Uh, are the audio recordings accessible through the Teachable website? Yeah. Uh, you can download it or play it. Uh, impact? Yeah, awareness of the self makes a huge impact. Uh, see more helpful than the tallying. Yeah, if you find self-monitoring like CBT style better than keeping a tally, then do it, do it. Um, yeah, like, I mean, it's not for everyone. Actually, there are certain personality types that, you know, aren't particularly suited to doing it that way, at least not without a bit of coaching. I found the volume in the audio very low. Listen to it on headphones and, and turn it up. I only use the tying for skin picking. That's fair. Found it harder to remember to self-monitor. Set reminders or cues up for yourself, basically. Uh, for self-monitoring, is it good to track positive reactions as well as negative ones you would like to stop? Not normal. It's normally more useful to track the negative ones uh, for a bunch of reasons. Um, it, it, one of, I mean, it could be beneficial to track positive ones, but generally in this type of exercise, you're, you're probably going to get more benefit from tracking the negative ones, partly because a major aspect of it, like I mentioned before, is the ability to nip them in the bud or remove their automaticity to deautomatize the escalation of negative habits, which is not something you want to do to positive ones. Uh, iPhone tip. Cool. Let everyone read that. I was wondering, what do you think of a hedonist 
who uses stoic techniques in order to deal with painful thoughts and emotions. I simply do not believe in virtue for its own sake. Yeah, I mean, that's not... Yeah, I do believe in virtue for its own sake, but, you know, if you want to use stoicism as a form of hedonism, I guess what you'd be doing would be more akin to Epicureanism, uh, perhaps of the Cyrenaic philosophy, but, you know, that's fine. Um, you know, as long as you... I, you know, it's your philosophy of life, um, go for it. Uh, pleasure isn't a bad thing in stoicism. It's just that the Stoics... What I would say is there's some reason to believe from modern psychology that when we directly try and control positive feelings that that can in some ways be counterproductive or particular, even more so when people directly try to remove negative feelings that, that often backfires especially if they are people who have a, an anxiety or depressive disorder. Um, so th or, or modern therapists will be a little bit wary about um, avoiding negative experiences, uh, internal experiences as a kind of goal in therapy. Okay, I'm going to just shoot through and see if I can find some more random questions. Uh, you guys are discussing things among yourselves now. I think that might do for the time being. There's a lot of discussion going on, I can see. Uh, wow, okay. Oh, are you guys not able to post links? Right. In the comments afterwards, when this video ends, and then it'll just be a couple of minutes and the, a recording will appear, um, then you will be able to, to post links uh, in the comment section on YouTube under the recording. So that's 45 minutes. I guess we should probably draw things to a close there. Thank you everybody for taking part. After we finish, I've got a couple more minutes to go through and see if there's any bits of the live chat that I've missed. Uh, and then if you still have questions, like I say, post them in the comment section afterwards and I'll be happy to respond. And other than that, I look forward to uh, meeting you again at future webinars and in the discussion forums and the course. And it's goodbye from me in Nova Scotia and goodbye from, from Mickey Dog. Uh, so good luck with everything. Stay in touch. <laughs>